Welcome to Study the Solopreneur, a series where we learn about the rewards and challenges of those who've built a successful career for themselves while paving the way for others like you to do the same. I am your host, Dana Gore, and I'm glad to have you with us. So let's get started. Hey guys, and welcome to Study the Solopreneur, a series where we discuss the rewards and challenges of living your truth, freeing your mind, and being creative, of starting your own business, doing work you love. Today's guest and I go back several years. Jeff Siegel, bachelor's in science, NSCA, CPT, CSCS, and CPTS, is the owner and creator of Balanced Personal Training in Boca Raton, Florida. He is a personal trainer, motivational speaker, and writer, and if I'm not mistaken, the recipient of at least one or two awards in the fitness industry. Jeff is an MS exercise specialist and travels the country give, giving talks about how to stay healthy and active, living with multiple sclerosis. I first met Jeff during the Special Populations Post-Rehabilitation course at Fitness Institute International, Inc., School for Personal Training. Jeff was the guest instructor for the lecture on MS, and we've been friends ever since. Jeff will tell you his story about his initial, initial diagnosis with MS and how he chose to respond to it and how he created a career for himself, spreading awareness, hope, and well-being for those also living with MS. It's an inspiring story, not just for those looking to create a lucrative career for themselves as a solopreneur doing what they love, but for anyone living with a health condition that makes them feel stuck physically, mentally, and emotionally. So without further ado, here's Jeff. Hey, Jeff, I am thrilled to have you with us today. How's it going? It's going great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about this. I am too. I am thrilled to have you as my guest. I love your story. I have enjoyed, I've, I've enjoyed your story since the first time we met, and I, I know that you've made a huge difference in people's lives, and we will get into that. Um, but I think what I wanted to start with was, like, what, before all of this happened, what did you originally plan on doing for a living? I, was, I had the same plans as I have right now. In fact, my goals were similar. Um, I had studied exercise science in college and I was working with individuals that were, were healthy. So that my career path was starting off the same way I had anticipated it. I just kind of changed my direction when, you know, when I had the problems with my diagnosis and later had the problems with how many symptoms I was dealing with. So that's how I started out. I started out, I came in as a personal trainer with a background and a college degree. And that's really, um, you know, I just changed it who my clientele was going to be. I kept some of the same clientele, but my goal was really to help people that were going through what I was going through because I didn't see much help or uh, there wasn't much information out there. So I wanted to learn how to spread the word the right way. Gotcha. Okay. So you were already going to go into it, but this pretty much carved out your specialty is what it is. Yeah. I guess I, I put it as, you know, I, I developed a core, um, a core of information that I was using and when I was diagnosed and I was, I was already working with people, but once I was diagnosed, I kind of took a step back and said, I got to uh, look into this and see how I could help myself realizing there wasn't a lot of information. There wasn't a lot of resources that pertain to exercise. And I kind of, um, kind of, it was kind of a good luck thing for me, I guess. I look at my diagnosis as a turn for the better because I think my life is better off now knowing that I have MS, I take care of myself and I'm helping others. Excellent. Okay. I don't think a lot of people would look at it that way. So it's really cool that you did and you were able to do something so productive and creative and, and motivating with it. Yeah, I, I felt great. I mean, I had my, my vision was you know clear what I wanted to do once I had the issues I was having. I just didn't know how to do it. And that kind of led me to some more education, research, and then developing my own information that I'd gathered and, and spreading it. But I went through, which I'm sure you're probably going to talk about, with Dr. Abbott and the Fitness Institute International was a great path for me to take because it really opened up my mind and allowed me to see what I had already been doing in a more clear and functional manner. Gotcha. When did MS first make its appearance in your life? 
Um, that's really a tough one because, you know, there's a difference between your diagnosis state and when it, when it was, you know, you felt your first symptom. Most people will feel their first symptom and they go a long time before being diagnosed, sometimes years, sometimes decades. And for me, I had my first symptom, which I didn't even know was a symptom, years before my diagnosis. And I'm kind of happy I wasn't diagnosed at that time because I was 15, I was fishing in Costa Rica, 100 and something degree weather, high humidity. And with all that heat, I had uh, experienced some visual issues. And at night, I was going back to where I was staying before going out to fish again the next day. And I was reading books I couldn't read. I mean, I, I could not see the words on the page of the book. And I just blamed it on the patch that I was wearing for uh, seasickness. So that kind of came and went. It took about a month for my vision to fully come back. And I never had a problem again until I was 25 years old. Wow. So then at 25, that's when I got my diagnosis. Now that's where the juicy part comes in. <laughs> when I got my diagnosis, I was out one night um, I had a drink and when I went to taste the drink, my lip was numb on one side. So, um, I guess it wasn't the nicest thing to do. I asked somebody else if they wanted to try my drink and they did. And then my drink was fine to them. And I just went about my evening and I woke up in the morning with half my face numb and it kind of freaked me out, but I just figured it was some kind of virus going around, kind of put it on the back burner because at 24, all, we all have that feeling that we're invincible. So I figured it was going to come and go and it kind of progressed and progressed and it went into the other side of my body. I woke up a few days later, I felt like my leg was wet and it wasn't. And when I went to touch it, I realized that I really had no feeling in it. So within about a week or so, I had half my body I could not feel and half my face I couldn't feel opposite sides. And with the background I had, the only thing I ever knew that really could do that would be a stroke. So that was about the time I went and got uh, some medical advice. And it was, it was kind of scary, but kind of not. I mean, I was, um, I'm always the kind of person who just feels like whatever's meant to be is meant to be. So I'm going to deal with this. But I went to the doctor the doctor, um, told me I need to see a neurologist. And I said, okay, I'll make an appointment. And they said, we already did. And that kind of freaked me out a little bit. And they, I said, when's it for? And they said, as soon as you get there. So I went there, I went through the diagnostics, blood work, finally got MRIs and they finally, um, at that time, I had started to lose vision in one of my eyes, and that was kind of like seal. That kind of sealed the deal of the diagnosis. I think, uh, looking back at all the different, you know, all of the criteria they were going through. So when I went to the doctor in the uh, the night before, I went to the doctor. I was there late, and they told me that it could have been one of twenty things. They were still looking through everything, and I was adamant about sticking around to find out what the twenty things they thought could be. So I told them I wasn't going to leave till they told me all of them which was my first mistake. And they, uh, they told me a bunch of different things. The only things I remembered was brain tumor or stroke. So I was becoming a professional patient at that time. And I realized that it's important to have someone with you when you're going through something like that, because whatever your position tells you when you're sitting there under duress, uh, you're not going to really remember everything. So if you, if you bring someone else and you, and you come back with 50% of the material, you're, you're a step ahead of the game. But, the next morning, the doctor called me at 7.30 in the morning and they said, can you come on up here? And you know, they, to, make a, to make a short story long, <laughs> now, to make a short story long really was, um, I, I ended up driving up there myself. They told me to have to get a ride. And when I got into the office, the doctor asked, uh, asked me to sit down. I sat down, he was standing over me. Just kind of, um, I felt like David and Goliath in the room. And he said, we're just about, 90 plus percent sure that you have multiple sclerosis and I smiled and the doctor said why are you smiling and I said because I didn't have a brain tumor or a stroke and he said that's why I didn't tell you all the things that um, I thought it could be you just you know were making demands that you weren't going to leave my office until I until I told you so so I was relieved and I went home and didn't really know what to do I told my parents and I called them about four hours later I was up in Tallahassee at the time and I said, I just want to let you know I'm okay and you don't have to come up here. They told me it's too late. We're halfway. So they were coming up from Miami at the time. So that's how my diagnosis came about. What, didn't they tell you you weren't going to walk again? Yeah, that came later. Um, this was my first episode that I had. And over the next year or so, about a year and a half, I had several episodes one after another after another and i was taking a medicine there was only three meds available at the time for ms 
and I switched meds and my disease activity slowed down. So I, where I was having so many flare-ups in a year, I wasn't having any. And about a year later, I had a really big one and um, it left me unable to walk, barely able to talk. I could barely able to see. And my doctor eventually told me that he didn't believe I'd be able to walk again and was kind of preparing me for life without being able to walk or without recovering from all this stuff. And that did, allowed me to do two things. I got rid of that doctor because I thought a doctor should never uh, make a prediction like that. And it, it kind of lit the wick of my, you know, explosive like outcome, which was, I'm going to do everything I possibly can while I can. And that's all that went through my mind was, I'm not going to sit back. I'm going to, I'm going to defy everything he said, and I'm going to do things differently. And, um, you know, I was, you know, very motivated to get better faster than he predicted, which was pretty much never. Wow. So that pretty much answers the next question about what made you handle it, handle it with the strength and resolve that you clearly still carry around to this day. Well, somewhat, I mean, I looked at it as I really didn't have a choice. I, I, the way I have always been in my life was, you know, you do what you can and what you can't do, you move on to something else. But I knew I could do this. I knew that I had walked before. I knew I, um, I knew that there was something out there that was going to change things. I was optimistic. And, um, you know, yeah, basically I had, there were two choices I had was sit back and kind of let the world spin while I'm sitting there and pass time or do something. So I did something and every day I woke up, I would try to get up and I'd fall and I'd started crawling and, and doing whatever I can to ambulate. And I realized that, well, Hey, I can crawl. And that was kind of like my path to learning how to walk again, because the cadence was the same and I was developing some core strength. But over the next year, I got on my feet again you know, after several falls, because every day, I, no matter how I did the day before, I said, this is going to be the day. And eventually, one day, I got up and I stood up and stayed up, and I haven't been down since then. And that was the end of 2002, to the beginning of 2003. Wow. Wow. So, I, so to go back to that, a year later, almost to the day, I was playing in a pick up basketball game and I dunked a basketball two hands and I made sure the doctor got the information that that happened. And, uh, you know, it was, it was the first time I dunked the basketball two hands and it was post paralysis. So I was pretty excited. Now, if that happens to anybody and you know that that, and you know that you can do something that strong and that, you know, uh, powerful, anything else that comes your way is pretty much, um, it's not going to affect you the way it would normally have. I mean, I was really optimistic and I knew I could do it. And I knew I did it and I knew now it was time. How can I help other people do this? Gotcha. Yeah, that's very inspiring. Um, how did you come across Fitness Institute International with all of this? Uh, I had a friend that was, that was living in Boca Raton. He lives in Delray Beach now. And he was telling me about these uh, classes that he was taking. And he knew that I had already had a, uh, an extensive background in, in exercise science. He was giving me all the information as he was going through the classes. And I was really intrigued by how much, um, how much information was passed out that I hadn't learned. And he took the class functional exercise, functional training. And that was with uh, Juan Carlos Santana. And I was, I was just blown away by what he was showing me. It was a similar, you know, the movement's a movement, but what he was showing me was different types of movements that, that they were explaining that it was not in the textbooks that I've read in the past. And I had, I had learned some different things about what they called functional fitness. And until I really took the class, I didn't know the difference between functional fitness and what people just called playing around in, um, you know, kind of a circus act thing in the gym that really had no, uh, you know, the goal was to, to do something that looked kind of cool, which does play a part because, you have to enjoy what you're doing. And if it's in the realm of fitness, then, you know, you're doing a hundred percent more than if you weren't at the gym or wherever you exercise. Yeah. I loved JC's class personally. I loved the functional training class. It was a lot of fun and it was, it was very informative, different, you know, Yeah, different, but applicable to any population. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it was fun. So, yep. So we know that everybody or almost everybody who attends Fitness Institute usually goes into personal training in some form or another, which obviously you did, even though you had made the decision beforehand. But what made you decide to go into public speaking? Well, I was, 
I never in my life had I thought I'd become, you know, good at speaking to large crowds. It was in schools when I was young, you know, when it was my day to do the report, I was hoping that I was sick or I would tell my parents I was sick or I would ask the teacher and I'd beg them, can I not get up and speak? And that was uh, the case up until my senior year in high school. I was the captain of my football team and, um, and they were having the very first pep rally of the season and the coach got up in front of the entire school and he went to uh, read out the roster and call everybody up and he, he didn't have the roster with him. So rather than figure out what to do, he did figure out what to do. He handed the microphone to me and said that I was going to announce the team. And I looked, first I looked at the crowd and everybody was staring at me and, and I'm not used to that. When I played sports, I didn't even, I couldn't even, I had no clue who was in the crowd. Everything was silent, but what was going on in the field or in the court. So at this time I was, I was thinking, Oh my gosh, how am I going to get off, get out of here without anybody realizing that I just took off. I can either take off or I can make it work. And my choice was to make it work. So I found a way to do it. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't looking for the excuses for more than a half a second. And I just winged it and it came out perfect. I knew about half the players' names. I called them out. They came up. Um, the other half, I started calling out their numbers. And then the rest, or, you know, there's a, a, a small percentage of people that I didn't even know their name. They didn't have a jersey on. And I gave them a nickname. And it worked. Mm -hmm. And from that, from that point on, I think that I kind of uh, wore out every butterfly that there was that was going to ever be in my stomach because that was the last time I ever felt butterflies speaking. Wow. All right. So basically, you were nervous at first. Um, and then I guess it started to become natural to you after, after that whole thing. Yeah, exactly. It became natural. And I realized about halfway through that, and I look back at it, but halfway through that scenario, I was loving it. And I look back at it and I always think, you know what, no matter what I do, I'm never going to be put in a scenario that difficult to get myself out of. So that would kind of lay the groundwork for me not having any uh, nerves or butterflies or worries. And I started by finding support groups and I would, I went to one support group. And when I went to that support group, you know, I, I understood there was a lot of different types of people and different thoughts going on in there. But the speaker that was talking to everybody, I, w I just felt wasn't very good. And I, and all I could think of is, wow, I can do a better job than this person. And I don't even need a topic. <laughs> I could get up there and do a better job and get people interested. And, you know, a, a couple months went by and I'd put together what my recommendations were for exercise because there was not a lot of literature on exercise and MS at that time, there's still most of the doctors were telling people not to exercise. So I, I got through most of the research pretty quick, being that there wasn't much. And I started giving presentations at support groups until I got picked up by somebody else that noticed it. I did some um, presentations for corporations and a pharmaceutical company that made the medicine that I was taking asked that I speak for them for a while. And eventually they hired me, me to be on their speakers bureau. Wow. And, and they gave me training to speak to do public speaking. It was very helpful in certain ways, but, uh, and I do it every year, but I kind of do have my own way of doing things. So I took what I needed at, out of that whole, those classes, used it on the stuff I didn't need. I didn't really worry about. And that's how, um, you know, I, I've been doing that ever since. And I love speaking. I, I probably feel more comfortable speaking in front of a large group than I do on the phone right now. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, I've watched your videos. You're engaging and funny and everybody seems very much at ease with you. So I guess, I guess that's because you enjoy doing it and you, you know, you know what you're talking about. You're comfortable. Yeah. And I, what I really try to do is I try to make everybody who's watching, no matter if it's 10 people or, or 10,000 people, that I'm speaking to them in particular. So I, I try to make eye contact with everybody. Even if I'm not paying attention, I make it seem like I'm looking at everybody because I'm going on with my speech. And, you know, I know what people feel when they're going through um, issues and problems. So while they're relating to me, I'm going on. To, and I try to make it funny because I know when people laugh, they remember. And rather than think about not having a good time or not enjoying this, or this is just some person talking that I can't wait till he's finished, it seemed like they just kept wanting more information. They wanted me to stay up longer than I was supposed to. And, you know, it kind of got me in trouble here and there. And I did that for a little bit, but now I've learned how to cut my talks at on a dime. So that's how I got into public speaking and that's where I've gone with it.
All right. Well, for the folks listening, uh, I highly encourage you check out Jeff's videos because they really are, they're interesting. Uh, even if the subject doesn't pertain to you personally, it's, I think you'll find that they're easy to watch, easy to listen to. And I'm going to go ahead and include at least a link to one of the videos. I'll probably choose the one where Jeff so kindly plugged my book. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. We'll put that There's in. A lot of them that I'll plug your book, but that, the one you got, yeah, that, that's a good one. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Good to know. <laughs> yeah, not all of them are, are recorded. Out loud. recorded. So, <laughs> so, you know, the ones that are video recorded I have on YouTube or they're on another site on YouTube. No, very cool. Well, we'll make sure that all of that stuff is definitely put into the description box. But yeah, very good stuff. I mean, and I have a short attention span and I, you know, it kept my interest. So oh, that's great to hear. <laughs> yeah. So tell me what rewards and challenges have you experienced in this career? Well, the financial rewards is what people use. Are, those are the things that people look at a career and they say, are you successful? And they think it, they think it, basically is how much money you're making determines your success, which is not the case. Because when I've made very little money, I still felt that I was very successful because I enjoyed what I was doing. I was accomplishing what I set out to accomplish. And at the end of the day, the people who I worked with were happy that I was happy. And even if it wasn't making a million dollars or whatever people view as, you know, success, I was content. So, you know, to me, success can't be measured monetarily obviously rich or poor it's nice to have money but seeing somebody get out of a chair who truly believed that they wouldn't be able to who who's actually said those words to me on several occasions many different people have said i can't stand out of a chair and i asked them well how do you know and they just tell me they just know and i said have you tried it well i have and i said how? and i'll tell them i ask them how long and they I, and I and I watch how they get out of a chair. So watching somebody get out of a chair and me in a second, I can see that I can show them an easier way to do this. They forgot they're doing something different or they're getting used to using their hands. So all it takes me, you know, if it takes me one whole session or 10 minutes and they stand up, the look in their face after they stood up thinking that they can't is priceless. And that's what I get out of what I do. The monetary part of it follows because you know, you get somebody who can't do something and thinks they'll never be able to do something and they do it. Now they have belief and they believe in you. And that's my goal is if they not just believe in me, but believe in themselves. I tell them, I'm just handing you a, like a coupon. You have a coupon. This coupon says you can do more. And I promise you, you can. And you've already, um, you've already done more than you thought you'd be able to do. So from here on out, just believe me and then believe in yourself and we're good to go. That's the way I think of it. And that's success. Yeah. I, you know, it's really cool that you brought that up. I had a discussion with somebody in an interview that I was the guest on and they asked me about success. And I said, well, to me, success was living your truth, you know, and being able to express that. And what you just said really is very similar to, to that. I know that, you know, we all have to make a living. I mean, we live in a world, you know, where that is a thing, but I've personally never really counted my success on the money thing, but whether or not it was something I got up and felt was a natural expression of me and made a difference. So, yeah. And, you know, I've had so many opportunities come and go where I've looked at them, I've looked them up and down and, you know, the money was a little bit better or a lot better, but then I saw myself, how do I see myself in that position? Am I going to be happy? Am I going to be productive? Is it going to be some thing that I can call successful at the end of the day for me the, in my uh, definition of success. And I had to pass on a few things because A, it might have been too much on me or B, it just, it just wasn't what I enjoyed doing. And I didn't think I'd be able to help as many people doing those things. So mm -hmm. I do pass on a lot of stuff based on what's going to make you know me happy. Okay. Well, what about challenges? What kind of challenges do you experience, if any? Uh, I, my biggest challenge is, and I, I'm going to talk about other people that I work with in challenges, because for me, my challenges um, are usually based on what other people's responses to what I do. And I always get, you know, you go out, when I'm speaking to a large group of people or when I'm working one-on-one, -on -one, you get the same questions and you get the same um, thoughts from different people. And the difficult 
part of it was, which I've come to, kind of overcame, was expressing and, and explaining what I'm trying to get out in lay terms. And originally that, in, and as you know, you've been through Dr. Abbott's classes. That's one of the best things that you can get out of that is how to communicate with people that don't understand the science behind what you're doing in lay terms rather than the way you think about it and were taught. He helped me out with that a lot because, you know, how he was so adamant about while you're doing your practicals, uh, expressing yourself like a normal person would be able to understand. He made sure that we could do that. And that was, you know, once I, once I picked up on that, it was easy, but that was the most challenging part is talking to someone who's in a chair and explaining hip extension. And they really don't care about what hip extension is. You just got to show them the movement. So, and, and with, with MS, one of the biggest challenges for people because they have cognition issues and, you know, if their cognitive, um, if MS is affecting them with memory, you really have to make sure that they're, they're absorbing what you're saying. So I'll have some people where every single time I've worked with them for years, I'm still explaining the name of the exercise, showing them the exercise, and then asking them for feedback. And after that happens, then they remember and they don't have to, you know, it's not that you can't do trial and error with form, you know? So that was, that was one of the biggest difficulties in addition to other people not understanding what an invisible illness is. Uh, because I've had several times where people said, what do you mean you have MS? Well, you look fine. And Hey, I'm always going to smile and say, thank you. When someone tells me I look good, uh, because the con on the contrary, if they told me I look bad and you look like you have MS, then I'd be pretty pissed off. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's what, and so many people get annoyed with people, um, who have MS when they say, well, you look so good. And what they're hearing is, well, you don't look sick to me. And what they're feeling is probably is something that most people would never in a lifetime, um, experience or would want to experience. So, th so there's a lot of invisible illnesses out there that, uh, that don't get much notoriety because, you know, even fibromyalgia, a lot of people who have it, they're told, oh, that's just a name people gave an illness uh, because they couldn't explain everything. It doesn't matter what it is. People are still feeling pain just because they may not look like they are. So it's hard to really um, get that out there. All right. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, that's good to know. And I'm sure a lot of people will relate with what you just said. Um, I wanted to ask you, do you have, what new projects do you have on the horizon? I know you're always up to something. I got a lot of fun stuff ahead of me. Yeah, well, I mean, short term, I'm going to Seattle this week to go to one of the largest MS conferences, uh, the neurological conference. It's called the CMSC. It's the um, Consortium for MS Centers in the, in the U.S. And I'm going to be presenting the night before it begins and working in it and going to some lectures. So that's a project that, you know, every week it seems I have another project that that's maybe a, a speech I'm giving that has a little bit different um, audiences or something. So there's going to be a lot of physicians that are listening, which is great because I like to educate physicians. Um, and I've got a good name with them. So, you know, I have they, they give me the respect that I give them and it works out. Other things that I have on the horizon are I'm going to be working with the NSCA and human kinetics on their third uh, edition of the essentials of personal training to help with, um, you know, reconstruct the MS section and neurological conditions section of the book. So that's a really big thing. And I'm also working on a, a host of videos that are going to be geared towards the MS population. Wow. All right. Well, anything, anything about that, that I can put into the links in the description, I, I will totally do it. And folks, in case you don't know, uh, the NSCA is one of the top uh, organizations for personal training, health and fitness, as far as a credible education, a credible um, certification. So just, just wanted to put that out there. Jeff, what, if any, advice would you give to people who either want to start their own solopreneur career as a health and fitness professional the right way or as a motivational speaker? And what advice would you give to those living with MS? 
it's kind of the same thing. It's a real. This is this is like the real world. It's a real world question. Um, I think that the most important thing that anybody can do, whether it's having MS or being an instructor or a teacher or a student, is to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and accept who you are and believe in yourself. I mean, I I always in most of the talks I give, at some point I'll talk about being able to smile and starting the day off happy. And if you start the day off happy by looking in the mirror and smiling at yourself, you get the return smile and you can get through the day with, without, you know, without someone asking, if someone asked me on any given day, have you smiled today? I can always say yes, first thing in the morning. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes I laugh at myself doing it, but I do it every day. And, you know, I don't, I, don't, I can't remember a day I haven't smiled besides that. But I think it's important to believe in yourself, to feel good about yourself and to feel that whoever you're going to cross paths with, you can, you have the opportunity to teach and learn something from them. And if you do those things at the end of the day, you're going to be better off than you would have been if you didn't. All right. Well, a real world question. That was a <laughs> world all encompassing answer. So I appreciate that. That pretty much went for everything. <laughs> Jeff, where can people find you? Um, on the internet, if you can find if you Google my name and exercise and MS, those three things, Jeff Siegel, MS exercise, you can find me anywhere. But um, I have a website, it's balancedpersonaltraining.com. Uh, I also have uh, on YouTube, you can see my videos on MS Views and News Learning Channel, which is a really great thing that they have. It's an organization that helps people with MS that has programs all over the country and they record them. So there's neurologists, there's all sorts of different doctors um, giving talks and myself, I have uh, dozens of, of presentations on there. And I think that it's, um, it, it's a great tool for anybody, but that's the place to find me. <laughs> if you really want to see some of my presentations, though, just about all the ones that have been recorded are on there. Okay. And if people for any reason want to contact you, they'd be able to do, do so through that? Through that or um, Jeff A. Siegel on Instagram, um, Jeff Siegel on Facebook, and my email address is jeff at balancedpersonaltraining.com. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Jeff, I will have all of those links in the description box. And I want to thank you for being my guest today. It has been such a pleasure chatting with you and sharing your ideas, insights, and story with our listeners. You have been a pillar of hope and strength for the MS community and the health and fitness community in so many ways. And I have no doubt that people have learned something new from this discussion that will bring enlightenment and inspiration into their lives. Well, thank you so much for having me, Dana. Uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Study the Solopreneur is about you. These discussions are meant to guide you toward living your truth, freeing your mind, and being creative. If you enjoyed this discussion, check out the playlist to listen to my other guests, and please like and share this video and subscribe to the channel. Thank you for being with us. All of the information discussed in this conversation, including Jeff's website and, well, I don't know about the website. <laughs> I don't know if there is a website, but if there is one in the future, I will put it in there. The YouTube videos and, and the social media stuff will all be linked in the description box below. I want to thank you guys for being here. Have a great day. And until next time, take care. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Study the Solopreneur. I hope this inspired you to take action to create a rewarding and successful career for yourself doing work you love. I am your host, Dana Gore, and if you enjoyed this conversation, I invite you to visit my website at IamMyImagination.com. Live your truth, free your mind, be creative. Until next time, take care.